Okay. So uh, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, for coming to this talk. So this talk is entitled uh, "AI Knows Words, AI Has the Best Words: uh, An Introduction to Natural Language Processing." Uh, and I would imagine that many of you probably caught the very not so subtle reference uh, in that title. I was very proud of that, but I have to give full credit to uh, Teresa for that one. Um, all right. So before we jump into uh, the content of this talk, I'll just uh, briefly introduce myself. So my name is Casey Theolis. I am an academic lecturer at the McGill AI Society. And what that means essentially is that um, I give uh, half of the lectures for our semesterly AI bootcamp, where we introduce a cohort of McGill undergrads to the basics of machine learning. Um, I also study Otters Mathematics and Computer Science at McGill. This is my third year, and I'll be graduating uh, this fall. Uh, I'm also an undergraduate research assistant at Mila. I've been working with Professor Jackie Chung uh, in natural language processing for the last two years. Uh, but this summer, I'm going to be starting off a new venture, and I'm going to be doing some uh, math and AI research uh, with Professor Adam Oberman. Um, and before coming to McGill, I was a uh, pure and applied science student at Vanier College. So for any of the CJEF or high school people in the crowd, well, there you go. That's a little more information about um, me before I got into university. <laughs> Uh, so just an outline of how this talk is going to work. So this is going to be a very, very high level and introductory overview of natural language processing. I'm not really going to go into too much detail on anything. Uh, I'm really just trying to give you a survey of what's out there in natural language processing, some of the kind of key issues that we think about in NLP, some of the main tasks that we work on in NLP. Um, so of course, you know, I'm in NLP research, so I'll be taking you know, more of a research perspective on this and maybe less of an applications perspective. Um, and uh, we'll close off. So we'll try to spend the last uh, half hour, depending on how good I'm doing on time. Uh, we'll spend the last half hour building our own text classification system uh, with scikit-learn. All right, so first off, I guess I should start by answering this uh, simple question, which is what I exactly is natural language processing? Uh, so before I do that, I think it's good to just kind of, you know, take a look at what NLP is capable of, right? And there are plenty of examples out there already in our daily life. We see it in the form of virtual assistants like Siri, Google's Assistant, or Amazon's Alexa, uh, or with Google Translate, which is particularly use, which I found particularly useful uh, throughout all of high school and up when I was taking French classes, <laughs> or um, also. More recently, there have been very powerful um, AI models that have been released uh, like GPT-3, uh, which is made by OpenAI. And this is a very, very large model that uh, uses the transformer neural network architecture. Uh, so for those of you who may have gone to uh, Sandy's talk uh, at 11 o'clock this morning, Sandy went over uh, the transformer architecture. And essentially, this has become kind of the foundation for a lot of the most successful uh, NLP models today. Um, and these models are actually so good that they are capable of generating artic news articles that fool humans into thinking that they were actually written by humans. Um, another very common application is closed captioning. Uh, so you'll see this on uh, YouTube videos where they're able to essentially take the speech input and automatically produce kind of uh, the text that goes with it. Now, this doesn't always work perfectly, but it's, it's gotten pretty good over the last few years. And yeah, so here's just a list of, uh, as I said, um, virtual assistants have become very popular, uh, chatbots, uh, automatic translation systems, uh, recommender systems as well are very popular on the marketing side of things. Uh, autocomplete as well on your phone is, an ex is a good example of a natural language processing system that's actually essentially taking into consideration the most recent words that you typed in your text message and then trying to predict what the next words you want to type are going to be. Uh, so that actually uh, is solving a particular natural language processing task called language modeling, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later in the talk. Um, all right, so now to actually define NLP, I'll kind of give you my very 
you know, my own interpretation of, of what NLP is. So you can think of NLP as the set of techniques that allow for computers to understand and or generate human language, right? And you notice right away from that definition that there are two very key facets to this, right? So on one side, we have natural language understanding or NLU. And on the other side, we have natural language generation, NLG. And we kind of separate out these two concerns, all right? So in NLU, we really, we're really focused on tasks that emphasize, you know, strong understanding uh, of a particular text in natural language, right? So this could be something like uh, having a, an AI system that can annotate text to say, uh, to give different parts of speech for words. So to say, this word is a noun, this word is an adjective, this one is a verb, this one's an adverb, and so on and so forth. Uh, natural language understanding is also a key part of any inference task where you're trying to determine whether sentence B makes sense. Like, so if you have two sentences, sentence A and sentence B, and then try to determine whether sentence A implies sentence B, whether sentence A contradicts sentence B, or whether there's no relation between them. That could be another example of a natural language understanding task. Uh, natural language generation is kind of the one that kind of makes all the headlines and gets all the hype. So these are, you know, these systems that are capable of essentially outputting very coherent text. So GPT-3 is a good example of this. AI Dungeon is another good example of this, if anyone has tried that out before. Um, but, you know, it is important to note that a lot of NLP systems require both of these. You need both understanding of language. So let's say if you're getting language input from a human, you need to be able to understand that and then also be able to generate language, let's say, if you're having a conversation with them. So things like Siri and Alexa and Google Assistant, they're going to need to have both NLU and NLG capabilities. Uh, so now just moving into some basic uh, NLP terminology. Um, so the first thing we need to think about when we think about language is, of course, words. Words are the building blocks of language, right? We put words together sequentially, in essence, uh, to form uh, more and more complex meanings. Um, but how would a computer actually understand a word, right? We can, we can say, you know, at a high level that our NLP system is some neural network, and then we're plugging in words as input to this neural network, and then the neural network at the end is going to output some prediction, right? That's all fine and good, but, you know, these, these machine learning systems, right, these computer systems, they only know how to work with numbers, right? Even if you just think about, let's say, putting in a particular word like hello as input, right? All the computer sees is ones and zeros, right? It's all binary to the computer. Um, so we need some way to be able to perform math on words, right? To be able to actually pass them through uh, these machine learning systems that we're implementing on a computer. Uh, and there are a few ways of doing this. Um, so the first way is an extremely naive approach. Um, and this is actually the approach that we're going to be implementing later, uh, just because it's kind of something that's easier to do in half an hour. Uh, the other more advanced approaches require a little more explanation, and I don't want to assume too much background. And also, they might just take too long to run. So we would be sitting here trying to train a model that would never finish before this workshop would be over. Uh, so in our, in our work, in our uh, activity, we're just going to use this approach. Um, and essentially, all this approach is doing is it's making a list of the vocabulary. So if you have a particular text, right, that you're working with, a text document, uh, you want to essentially compile a list of all the words that appear in that document, right? Um, and now the question of what is a word is, can get a little bit complicated. So like, do you include punctuation marks as words? Um, you know, what do you do about, um, you know, things like hyphen, hyphened or, uh, you know, these idioms or these expressions that are like multiple words? Um, so there's, there's some tricky things there, but for simplicity, let's just ignore all that now. Um, and just say that we have this list of words that we're able to extract from our document, right? 
And then what we're going to do with that is we're going to have an, a corresponding list that's going to contain all the counts. So that essentially just contains the number of times that we saw each word in the document. So for example, in this document here, I saw the word the two times, uh, a zero time, uh, one time, of zero times, and so on and so forth, right? So all we're doing is just extracting these word counts, right? And you know, the beauty of this is that this is really easy. This isn't very hard to do. Uh, there are functions in scikit-learn that could easily do this. And even if it wasn't implemented already in scikit-learn, this is not something that's particularly hard to implement. Uh, the problem with this, uh, well, there's several problems. Uh, so sparsity is one problem. So it's this idea that let's say that you have a massive vocabulary, right? Let's say that you're working with a huge collection of text data, right? Your vocabulary is going to get really, really big because there's so many different unique words that you're going to be seeing in that data set. But if you just look at any given sentence, let's say the sentence just contains 10 words, then at most only 10 entries in your list are going to be non-zero. But then there's going to be thousands of entries, which are all going to be zero. So it's, it's kind of a waste of space in that sense. Um, another big issue is that you have no information about word ordering this way. I'm just giving you a summary of the words that appear in the document, but I'm not telling you anything about the order in which they appear. So there's no notion of context. There's no notion of kind of sequ the sequential nature of language with one word following another. You don't have any of that here. Um, and then there's also another problem, which is the out of vocabulary problem. This is a little bit more of a complicated issue and I won't address that here in this talk, but is also something that is, that is worth considering. Uh, now, a more sophisticated approach to deal with this issue of how do we represent words is to use a technique called word embeddings. And this is actually the topic of, uh, of my research. Um, so this, in this case, we're just, we just wanna represent words as vectors uh, of a fixed dimension. So usually uh, in applications, we see vectors of 100, 200, or 300 dimensions. Um, and essentially these vectors are going to be learned in an, in an unsupervised fashion uh, from a large collection of text. And the goal is essentially for vectors for similar words to be located very close to each other in this embedding space. So in this uh, diagram over here, you can see that you, you would expect that the vector for apple be located very close to things like fruit and banana and vegetable, right? But that they would not be located necessarily close to uh, sorry, they would not necessarily be located close to things like monitor, screen, and television, right? Which are kind of like in their own other part of the embedding space. Um, not only do we have this kind of property where similar words tend to cluster together, but we also get this really interesting property called the analogy property. Um, so this is where you can actually perform operations like subtraction and addition on vectors in a meaningful way. So you can take the vector for the word Berlin and then subtract the vector for the word Germany and then add in the vector for France and you'll actually get the vector for Paris, which is pretty cool to say the least. Um, uh, there are some very uh, commonly used word embedding algorithms out there and I invite you to, to look into those on your own if you're interested. So uh, word to vec glove and fast text, I would say are by far the three most popular ones. Um, and they've been around now. So like in machine learning terms, you know, being, being around for eight years, right? So word to vec has been around since 2013. Uh, that's considered, uh, you know, ancient history basically in, in, in machine learning circles uh, because the field moves so fast. Uh, but in spite of that, I mean, these, these models have stayed very, very popular. And this remains probably the most popular way to, uh, to encode words, uh, at least in applications. Um, and so I think I kind of mentioned the pros. Uh, so they are able to encode relationships between words uh, in a nice way. Uh, it also solves the sparsity problem, right? So if you have a sentence which is made up of 10 words, you just put in the embeddings for those 10 words, right? And these are gonna be dense embeddings. So they're gonna be 300 dimensional vectors um, with all non-zero entries. Uh, however, there are some drawbacks. Uh, so one issue is what do you do about words with multiple meanings, right? 
you still don't have this notion of context. So you wouldn't be able to tell, right? If I give you the word Apple, do I mean Apple the fruit or do I mean Apple the company, right? Because Apple the company, well, Apple the company should probably be located somewhere close to this area with monitor, television, and screen, and maybe some other words like computer and tablet and so on, right? So uh, there's, still, there's still that issue uh, that, that needs to be resolved. Uh, so now, of course, we are doing machine learning uh, on natural language. Uh, and in order to be able to do that, we need data, lots and lots of data. Uh, so typically what's done in natural language processing is we work with these massive data sets, which we call corpora, or, or the singular version would just be corpus. Um, and these can contain easily up, you know, billions upon billions of words. They contain a massive amount uh, of examples of text documents. Um, and, and these are essentially the, what we use to train natural language processing models. Um, so there are several different uh, NLP tasks out there that are tackled both in the research community and in applications. Uh, so I'll just list some, uh, some common ones here. The, this is by no means exhaustive. Uh, so document classification is a very common one and is actually the one that we're gonna be doing in the coding session. Uh, and this essentially is just looking at what genre does this text document belong to? So I could imagine having you know, a bunch of text documents and let's say they all belong to different categories. Like one could be about sports, one could be about politics, another one could be about finance. Uh, so you want your NLP system to somehow be able to categorize all of the documents into these different categories. Sentiment analysis is extremely popular, especially uh, in marketing where companies are trying to determine whether uh, you know, their, their products are getting positive or negative feedback. Uh, so sentiment analysis is just trying to essentially, have an, essentially analyze the emotion behind a particular text and understand whether it's expressing positive or negative emotion. Uh, part of speech tagging and parsing are more grammatical tasks. So they're gonna be focused on trying to annotate individual words or groups of words in a sentence, and then be able to say whether these words are nouns, adjectives, uh, prepositions, and so on. Uh, machine translation, I think we all know what that is, very, very popular and continuing to make good strides there. Uh, summarization is a very, very difficult task uh, that has seen good progress in recent years. Um, and actually something that uh, my supervisor, uh, Professor Chung works a lot on. Uh, but, but there's still a lot of progress uh, to be made in summarization. Uh, question answering and reading comprehension is actually the example I have in the picture on the right over here. So in this case, you pass a paragraph of text and then you ask some questions to the NLP system, right? And essentially, uh, you know, see how well it comprehended the text, right? So you can think of this almost like the reading comprehension test you would do in high school. Um, so in this case here, you can see this is a particular kind of question answering where to answer the question, you just need to be able to extract the answer directly from the text. So just be able to like highlight the word in the text essentially that gives you the answer. But there are some more complicated question answering tasks you can think of where the machine has to generate more of a coherent explanation or a coherent sentence, right? And just extracting the answer from the text is not gonna be enough. Uh, language modeling, uh, so that's the last task I have listed here, uh, is arguably the most important task in all of natural language processing because it is the foundation uh, for these very successful models like GPT-3 and BERT, um, which are kind of at the forefront of natural language processing today. And essentially what this task consists of is just being able to predict the next word given the previous words. So you can think of this in the same sense as autocomplete on your phone, right? Where you just, you, you've typed in a few words and then the phone starts to try to predict what the next word is gonna be. Um, so language modeling is extremely important. It reflects kind of this sequential nature of language generation, right? Where you generate one word at a time and each word you generate depends on the previous words. Um, and What's commonly done with these big models, these big transformer models like BERT and GPT-3, is that um, 
you'll essentially train your, your huge transformer on a language modeling task first. So you'll give it a bunch of text data, you'll blank out some of the words and then get it to predict those missing words. And that's gonna be its pre-training. And then once you have that pre-trained model, then you apply it to a particular task that you wanna solve. So you, you fine tune it on a specific task. So let's say I'm trying to train a, a model for sentiment analysis. What I might do is I might take a pre-trained language model and then I'm going to then train it on a small sentiment analysis data set on top of its original language modeling tra training and then apply it to the sentiment task. So that was a kind of long-winded explanation with not very, very many, uh, not very many visuals. So I apologize for that. Hopefully that was clear. Um, so now um, there are still some very big challenges and open problems in NLP. And these were actually alluded to in the previous uh, workshop this morning. Uh, so common sense reasoning is a very big one. Uh, so being able to reason about ambiguous sentences like this one here, that says the trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big. And then you'll ask, okay, but what was too big, right? What is this it referring to? So now for the humans, uh, for, hu for a human reader, it's incredibly obvious that the trophy is the thing that's being referred to here, right? It's the thing that's too big for the suitcase. But for a, um, a machine learning system, this is not obvious at all. And machine learning systems actually struggle with this quite a bit. Uh, systematic generalization is another big problem in NLP. So we have NLP models, which we can train on very large uh, data sets in a particular domain. But then if we try to apply these same models to a different domain of text, a different area, a different genre, um, it just collapses. It doesn't, it doesn't do nearly as well, right? So to have that ability to generalize to new data um, is it's, it's still a huge, a huge roadblock in NLP. Uh, and last but not least, uh, last but not least, uh, low resource languages is a very, very big problem. Um, so a lot of what I just showed you here, this list of tasks applies very much to English, but maybe not so much to other languages because we have a ton of data for English. And a lot of the big NLP papers all have to do with applying these techniques to English language data. But there are plenty of languages out there that we don't have a lot of data for. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to develop good strategies for applying um, NLP techniques and solving NLP tasks uh, on these languages that we don't have a lot of data for. All right, so now I'm just going to quickly discuss NLP models and libraries. Uh, so you can generally think of two kinds of categories of machine learning models that are used in natural language processing. Uh, don't stress too much if you don't know all of these names. Um, this is kind of just to give you an overview of what's out there. But essentially, on, on the one hand, we have the classical slash statistical uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, so these are techniques that have been around for quite a while and have been applied even since the previous, the end of the previous century. So things like logistic regression, naive Bayes, and support vector machine. Uh, so logistic regression and support vector machine in particular so they're gonna work essentially by mapping your input data out, right, onto this, uh, into this space, right? So you can imagine if you have your word embeddings from before or your counts, right? These would be very high dimensional vectors, right? And then we would embed them in this vector space here, right? So you can imagine each point in this vector space represents a sentence, let's say. And then what we're gonna try to do with the support vector machine um, is we're going to try to pass a line through this or pass more accurately pass a hyperplane through this data to separate out the examples. So we can think of if we're doing sentiment analysis, for example, um, we pass a hyperplane through our sentences and we'll say that all of the sentences above the hyperplane represent negative sentiment examples. And then all of the ones below over here would represent positive sentiment examples. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it. Uh, naive Bayes is an example of a probabilistic model. So this is essentially trying to model the probability of uh, your inputs and outputs jointly. 
So what's the probability of seeing a sentence along with uh, a particular label for that sentence? Um, and then we have on the other side of things, we have neural networks. So neural networks are all the rage now and by, you know, the basis for um, these big and successful uh, language models that are out there. Uh, in particular, the recurrent neural network and the transformer stand out because they're specifically designed to deal uh, with text data and, spe and specifically designed to deal with data that comes in the form of sequences, uh, which is the case for things like language. Um, and essentially what a recurrent neural network is able to do is that it builds up this context of your sentence as you go. So you could imagine passing over each word, right? And then as you do that, you're you're viewing each word not individually, but also as a function of all the words that came before it. So you're gonna build up this contextual representation of your sentence, right? Where you have, essentially you're integrating this notion of context. You're not looking at each word in isolation, but rather um, all, you're able to look at the sentence as more of a complete and holistic unit. Uh, and transformer is a similar idea. So this was actually talked about in the first workshop. Um, and this has, this uses a mechanism called self attention. So this is where you can actually have each word in the sentence will be allowed to pay attention to other words. So you can think of this as the word is essentially picking out on the other words in the sentence that it depends the most on. So if you have a word, like, uh, if you have a noun, for example, the noun might pay attention to the adjectives. Uh, that describe it. Or if you have a pronoun, you might have a pronoun pointing to uh, the noun that it's referring to, for example. Uh, all right, so now I've got to kind of speed this up because we should get to the workshop. Um, but very quickly, I'll just talk about on the implementation side of things. So there's some um, Python libraries out there for NLP uh, that you can make use of for your NLP projects. Uh, so NLPK is a very, very popular one. We're not going to be seeing that in the activity, um, but it contains many useful functions um, for processing natural language data. And they also contain uh, many data sets uh, in NLP that you can import directly into uh, your Jupyter notebook or into your Python script. Uh, NumPy is used, you could, is used for the data structures, essentially. Uh, so you can store uh, your data in a NumPy array uh, in a matrix form, uh, and you can perform operations like matrix multiplication and matrix vector multiplication. Uh, Scikit-learn is amazing. It has plenty of uh, implementations of statistical learning models, as well as tutorials. Uh, and we're actually going to be following one of their tutorials in the second half of the workshop. Uh, and TensorFlow and PyTorch are more on the side of deep learning. So these are, these are the libraries you would go to to implement the deep neural networks. So the recurrent neural networks and the transformers, for example. Um, and then there's Hugging Face, uh, which is a very recent library uh, that contains implementations of uh, several state-of-the-art uh, deep natural language processing models uh, for applications like summarization, translation, and generation. Uh, and more. Uh, so the great thing about Hugging Face is that it does a really good job of keeping up with the latest research. So Hugging Face will have implementations of uh, recent uh, NLP models like BERT and GPT-2. Uh, I don't think it has GPT-3 because GPT-3 is absolutely massive, um, but, but it contains uh, several implementations of, of the most popular uh, transformer models that are out there. All right, so uh, with that, uh, I think we can move to the activity. Uh, hopefully I didn't go too fast and scare people too much. Uh, I hope that was all clear. Uh, maybe I don't, okay, so it's 1.34 now. Maybe I could just take, uh, I'll just pause for a second and just see if anyone has any questions about the first half. Okay, not seeing anything popping up in the chat. So that means either 
I have mesmerized you to the point that I've scared you and you have no idea what's going on, or everything was crystal clear. Uh, and considering I'm an undergrad, you know, giving uh, one of my first ever talks, I'm going to guess that I've confused you all horribly. So I apologize for that. <laughs> all right. Um, so I guess we can move into the uh, text classification uh, system example. So uh, I posted the links on Discord, but if anyone can't see them, let me know and I can also post them uh, here in the Zoom chat. Uh, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to work with a, a data set called the 20 news groups data set. Uh, and it contains uh, 20,000 text documents. And these are coming from uh, 20 different categories. So you, uh, some of the categories include uh, baseball, uh, motorcycles, graphics, electronics, uh, and so on. And essentially what our goal is going to be is we, we want to classify each of these documents in the correct category. Uh, so we're going to try two different approaches for this. We're going to use uh, naive Bayes and support vector machines. Uh, I would have loved to use neural networks, but that would take too long to train. Uh, and we do have limited time. So I decided to keep things simple. Um, we're going to be following a tutorial from scikit-learn. Um, and I have two notebooks. So as I said at the beginning, uh, there's going to be one notebook which I'm going to be using to code live. And then there's one notebook which contains uh, essentially the completed uh, code. So I'm just going to try to figure out what the best way is for me to do this. Let me just stop sharing for a second. And I'm going to kind of, all right, should be OK. If anyone doesn't have the links, please let me know. Okay. Should be here. OK. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to uh, import the data from uh, 20 news groups. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make this import statement here. And now I need to make sure that I'm writing this correctly. I'm going to be kind of like going back and forth between screens. Um, So this first line here is just going to bring in a function that we're going to need uh, to import the data from 20 news groups. Um, and then the next step here, I think I'm just going to copy the line over from my completed code. It's going to be easier that way. So now what we can do is we can call this function fetch 20 news groups, and we're going to ask it for the training data set. Uh, from 20 news groups. Uh, we're going to set shuffle to true. So what this is going to do is that it's going to mix up all the training examples so that we don't have all of the examples for one category and then all of the examples for the next one and so on. Uh, we want them all to be kind of mixed together. Uh, so we can just run that. Uh, and this should load pretty quickly. It's not that big of a data set. Um, and then I just put a few print statements at the end here. So what these print statements are going to do essentially is they're going to, um, uh, so the first one here is 20 train.target names. So this is just the list of the categories that we have in our data set. So we have atheism, uh, graphics, uh, there's a Windows one, hardware, another hardware, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and then the other attribute that is important to consider uh, is the data attribute. So the data attribute of our 20 train object is going to contain uh, essentially a list of all of the documents uh, in our training set. So if I add another cell here, I can actually inspect my data a bit. So I'll do print 20 train dot data zero, uh, and I'll index it here, look at the first entry. So we see here, uh, this first document seems to just be an email. And there's some person wondering about two-door sports cars. Um, so now, if we want to see what the actual uh, label of this example is, um, I need to check my completed code to see exactly how I did this. 
So to see what the label of this example is, we can do 20 train dot target with the same index zero, and it's going to say seven. All right, but seven is not that useful. Uh, so what does seven mean? Well, essentially this seven just comes from this list here. So it's just an index for this list of all the categories. Um, so if we wanna have a more human readable uh, label, what we can do is we can say 20 train dot target names and then index that by 20 train dot target zero. And then it correctly says, right? So this, this belongs to the autos class, right? So this is a document that's talking about cars. Okay, so now that we have a little bit of a sense of what's happening in our data, uh, we can start, oh, see something in the chat. Oh, thanks, Philip. Um, so essentially, uh, now that we have a sense of what our data looks like, uh, we can start looking at how we can process this. So remember earlier in the slides, I talked about how we need to be able to convert words into some sort of numerical format. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, we're gonna compile that list of counts that I was talking about before. So what we do for that is we're gonna import from sklearn.feature extraction, we're gonna import something called count vectorizer. So count vectorizer is exactly what it sounds like. It's gonna count the words in each document, and then it's gonna produce a vector representation of each document, uh, which is gonna contain the counts for each word. Um, so we can initialize, uh, or we can rather instantiate a count vectorizer object like this. And then we can then ask it to fit uh, to, sorry, we can apply it to our data. And the way to apply it to our data is by calling this function called fit transform. And then we're gonna do this on 20 train dot data. And what this is going to do is this is going to produce a matrix of counts, right? So each row in the matrix is gonna represent a document in the data set. And then each entry in a row is going to represent the number of times a particular word appears. So to just verify that that is actually what's happening, we can print the shape of our matrix. So if we run this, oh, it doesn't like that. Why does it not like that? Did I do something wrong? Oh, yes, I did. Sorry. This would be feature extraction dot text. So then we run that. It's going to take its sweet time. Oh, actually, no, not that long. Uh, so, and it gives us the shape of our matrix. So the matrix has 11,314 rows, which is what we would expect. That's the size of our training set, right? Up here, you see the size of our training set is 11,314. And it also uh, contains 130,000 columns. So, uh, the 130,000 here represents our vocabulary size. So that's the number of unique words that appeared in this data set. Uh, so then next step now is we can train a model on this. Uh, so we can directly take these counts and plug them in to a machine learning model. So what we can do is from sklearn.naivebase import multinomial NB. So this is uh, essentially a class in scikit-learn that uh, implements uh, the naive Bayes um, algorithm. So this is a particular kind of machine learning model that works with probabilities. So what it's gonna try to do is it's going to try to find the probability that a particular document belongs to a certain category. Um, all right, so now to train the model, as all good things in scikit-learn, uh, we just need one line. This literally just takes one line. So we just call this function here fit, and we apply it to our training set, um, along with the training set labels, 
right? Very important. Uh, and that's just going to be uh, x train and 20 dot train target. So here are our inputs, and these are our expected outputs. So these, this is what we want our model to output. Uh, and we can run that. And of course, I made a mistake. What mistake did I make? Uh, oh, shoot. There we go. All right. So that works. So now our model is trained. Um, believe it or not, that was pretty fast. Um, and now if we want to see what our model actually learned and what it's capable of doing, uh, I'm just going to copy over this code from the completed section. Um, I think it's just better for me to copy paste it and then walk you through what it's doing. Uh, so essentially, we can just make a list of new sentences. So these are sentences that I just made up, essentially. Um, so things like, I just scored a home run. So we would expect that you know, our, our uh, model should know that this is a sentence about baseball. Um, and then here you have another sentence. That's a nice set of wheels. So you should expect that uh, the model knows that this has to do with uh, cars. So now to see uh, what would happen if we try to apply our model to these new sentences, uh, we can just uh, apply our count vectorizer onto these sentences. So get the counts for these sentences first. Um, and that's just using this function called transform here, which we apply to our new sentences. And then we can ask our model to make its prediction. Uh, and that's again, just very simple one line classifier.predict new counts. Um, and then if we want to print its actual prediction and see what it actually pre predicted, uh, this is just kind of a quick two-liner that's going to print out the model's predictions. So if I run that, you'll see here. So for the first sentence, I just scored a home run. Uh, the model correctly, correctly predicts that this has to do with baseball. Uh, and here, that's a nice set of wheels. The model correctly predicts that this has to do with cars. So now, if we want to see how this does on a larger test set, uh, we can check that out as well. Uh, so for that, I'm going to need the NumPy library, because I'm going to be working with matrices. So I'll just import NumPy. Uh, and then I can bring in the test set. So I'm going to load the test set the same way um, I loaded the training set, essentially. So the only difference is that instead of saying subset train, I'm going to say subset test. Uh, and I do want to shuffle. And I'll set the random state to 42, because what else would you want your random seed to be? Um, and this is going to hold our test set. So now if we want to uh, essentially have, um, well, first, I guess we should extract the data. So uh, how did I do this? So if we just want to extract the data, we can just pull out the data as follows, 20 test.data. And then if I want my counts for this data, I just do the same thing I did before, count vect.transform. Uh, and I apply it to docs text test. <laughs> uh, so now that I have this, I can make my prediction. So uh, I'll say predicted is equal to classifier.predict. And then I'm going to feed it in my counts. And then if I want to see how well it did, I'm just going to copy over this line. Uh, if I want to see how well it did, I'm just going to count the number of times um, that the prediction was equal to the true label in the test set. And then I'm going to average that. So this is just going to give me an accuracy score. Um, so I can run this, and this should hopefully work. And indeed, it does work. And we see that we get a 77% accuracy, which is actually pretty good. Um, because if you think about it, uh, we're working on a data set that has 20 classes, right? And there are 20 possible categories. So 77% of the time, this model is actually putting, is actually classifying the documents correctly uh, 
in one of these 20 categories, uh, which is pretty impressive for such a simple model uh, like Naive Bayes. So now if we want some more information about where exactly our model went wrong and like so where its mistakes were made, uh, we can use uh, additional metrics and summary statistics to get a sense of that. So I'll just copy this over. Um, and essentially what this is saying here, so classification report is just going to predict uh, some summary statistics about how well our model did on the test set. So it's going to look at uh, things like precision and recall. So precision and recall, I always get these mixed up. Uh, so hopefully I won't in front of a live audience because that would be terrible. Um, but essentially you can think of precision as the number of times that you predicted that uh, a text belong, a document belonged to category A divided by the number of times the document actually belonged to category A. Um, sorry, no, other way around. The number of times the document belongs to category A divided by the number of times you predicted it belonged to category A. Um, so basically it's saying how good, how good you are when you make a prediction about a particular category. Um, and then recall is a little bit of a kind of con complementary notion. So recall is saying the number of times you correctly predicted category A divided by uh, the number of times that uh, the model, sorry, the number of times that it belonged, that um, the instance actually belonged to category A. Um, and then F1 score is the harmonic mean of those two things. Um, so here you can see kind of some summary statistics that give you an idea of how well um, the model does in each of these categories. So you'll see, for example, uh, this Windows category, uh, we're doing pretty horribly. Uh, so precision is 20%. Uh, so essentially what that means is that uh, for any time that our model predicts Windows, it's only right 20% of the time when it predicts Windows. And then for recall, uh, oh, well, why is recall zero then? That's a little strange uh, not to think about that, I guess. But then, so recall is saying um, that uh, out of all the instances that belong to uh, Windows, uh, we're only right zero, uh, we're, we were right on those 0% of the time. Uh, that, that doesn't seem right to me, but <laughs> I'll have to think about that. Um, uh, and then at the bottom here, we can also print uh, this nice object called a confusion matrix. Uh, and what the confusion matrix does essentially is that it's going to uh, give you a full breakdown of your predictions and the actual results. So the main diagonal of the confusion matrix is telling you the number of times you, the document belonged to category A and that you actually predicted category A, right? So that would be like this entry here, right? And then this, this entry here would tell you the number of times uh, it belonged to category B and you actually predicted category B. And then all of these off diagonal entries in this matrix are represent mistakes. So these are, um, these are places where, let's say, uh, the instance actually belonged to class E, but you said it belonged to class A. So let's say that happened one time, right? Or in another case, let's say it belonged to class F, but you said it belonged to class B, and this happened 26 uh, times. So you can kind of see through this confusion matrix what your most common confusions and what your model's most common mistakes are. Um, I'm seeing some activity in the chat. So uh, Anthony asks, could 0.00, .00 be explained by the fact that the number is less than 0 0.01, so appears to be zero? Yeah, I think so. I think it's a numerical error. Yeah, I think that's probably what's happening there because the recall should not be zero. Uh, but essentially, yeah, so you can just think of it as um, out of all the times that you, that, um, the, the documents actually belong to the Windows category, uh, you correctly predicted that a negligible pro proportion of the time. <laughs> All right, so 
yeah, or less than 0.01% of the time, uh, less than 0.01 of the time. Okay. Um, so K times, Danielle, could you maybe give? I uh, means identity matrix. So uh, when I said uh, I means identity matrix, so like it means that um, everything not on a diagonal is zero. That's right, that's right. So if you have a diagonal matrix, then you're classifying perfectly. Uh, that okay. will pretty much never happen in practice, but that, that would be like kind of the optimal, you know, what we would want. Uh, all right, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the yeah. question. Okay. Um, all right, so I apologize if that was a little bit kind of rushed and, and not super cohesive. Hopefully, uh, hopefully everyone is okay with, uh, with this uh, coding example. Um, uh, I think since it's 155, and I know we're running out of time, uh, instead of implementing the SVM, uh, which is very, very similar, uh, what I'll just what I'll do instead is I'll just uh, take questions and maybe if there's any part of the code that uh, you would like me to look over, we can do that in the last five minutes. Uh, or any general questions about NLP or NLP research, I'm also happy to answer those as well. Okay, I guess no no takers for questions. Okay, um, so in that case, uh, what I can do is I can, instead of kind of like typing out the SVM example, I can just um, show it to you, show you the completed version. Um, so that code is over here. Uh, and essentially, so it's very similar to the naive Bayes idea. So you're just importing a different uh, a different class from Skype Scikit-Learn. Uh, so this is called SGD classifier. Uh, so SGD here stands for stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so this is the uh, it just essentially allows you to use uh, different machine learning models that are uh, optimized or trained via stochastic gradient descent. Uh, but we it's it defaults to support vector machines. So uh, we can just straight uh, just take it directly and just fit it onto our data and it's going to fit a support vector machine uh, to our data. So once again, we're fitting, we have our training set uh, inputs and our training set labels. Uh, we can test it on some new inputs that we manufacture manually. Uh, so similar story here, sport, baseball, uh, miscellaneous for sale. Okay, so then this one, it spits out a different label for this one than, than the naive base did. Um, and then similar idea, we can bring in the test set and then run this on the test data. So this gets 76% accuracy, close to 77. Actually, if we round it up, it is 77. Uh, and then once again, you can just break this down um, and look at specific, uh, you know, specific classes and look at the precision and recall. So in this case, you could see it's doing a whole lot better on the Windows category than uh, the naive Bayes was. Um, and then you have your confusion matrix at the end as well. All right, uh, so I think that's uh, all I had to say and I managed to keep it under, <laughs> under one hour. Um, so does anyone have any last questions before we have to uh, cede the room to the uh, next presenter? All right, uh, so I guess I'll 